I suppose that this is one of my Jacques moments à la Emile Zola today, as I'm both angry and worried. Welcome to Intuitive Reactions, the MENA and Gulf regions. This is an unscheduled and for me, unexpected number 29. But three things happened in the last 24 to 48 hours that pretty much coerced me to sit in front of the computer and speak out yet again. Early this morning, I got a, an article sent to me by a friend. The article in Middle East Eye was written by Professor Joseph Massad of Columbia University. Now, who, those of you who follow his uh, write-ups know that Professor Massad can be at times a tad contrary and abrupt in his uh, views and writings, but his points are definitely noteworthy too. And in this article that was sent to me by a friend, he took a swipe at Human Rights Watch and at B'Tselem, amongst others, and argued that the recent acknowledgements by human rights advocates of Israel's Jewish supremacist policies, apartheid, deserve condemnation, not praise. Why, you might well ask? Well, because the author thinks that those condemnations are coming far too late. Now, following that, I also got another academic in Paris who happens to be a friend of mine sharing on social media a Palestinian version of the George Floyd moment with an Israeli soldier pinning down a Palestinian in Jerusalem. And of course, the third thing, never two without three, was the violence, the physical violence and the structural violence that have become manifest once again uh, in Jerusalem and across the Palestinian occupied territories. Yesterday, for instance, I don't know how many of you saw the awful pictures of the Israeli army invading the Muslim sanctuary of Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock at night as Palestinian Muslims were praying during the holy month of Ramadan. Now, what worries me is not only that one single event, it's never a single event, but rather that another huge confrontation between Palestinians and Israelis could happen anytime in Jerusalem, not least tonight, because tonight for Muslims, it is Laylat al-Qadr, and a lot of Palestinian Muslims would go to spend the night uh, in Al-Aqsa Mosque. But also on Monday, it is Jerusalem day for Israelis and it is an observance day. So you can well imagine what could happen when those two polarities collide. Yet another confrontation, yet more violence, yet more people injured, yet more impunity. But when I talk about uh, my Jacques moment again, it's not because this is new. For those of you who've been following uh, developments and realities and political shenanigans uh, across the whole of the occupied Palestinian territories, know that it's been happening for decades when Palestinians have been under occupation. Think of Mount Scopus, Jabal Mukabbir. Think of Jabal Abu Ghnaim, Har Choma, this green verdant hill just bordering Bethlehem in the Southern West Bank becoming another settlement. 
think of Sheikh Jarrah, a neighborhood in the heart of Arab East Jerusalem, where a settler organization, Nahalat Shimon, want to confiscate the property of eight Palestinian families who've been living in their homes there in Sheikh Jarrah for decades. Four of those families are in imminent risk of losing their homes. Think of Silwan. Think of a few settlers controlling the lives and livelihoods of Palestinians in Hebron, Al Khalil. And the list goes on and on and on. But isn't international humanitarian law clear on this? After all, one cannot confiscate property or transfer people into the occupied territory. This is prohibited by international law and it could amount to war crimes. But is anybody worrying too much about what international humanitarian law says? Is it any wonder that some people are saying all this is a waste of time? Yet, despite all those examples I gave you, Al-Aqsa Mosque, uh, Sheikh Jarrah, all the other instances, month in month out, year in year out, decade in decade out, yet the reactions have been no more than whimpers, whether in the past or more presently, more recently. Instead of robust solidarity, instead of thumping one's hand on the table and saying we must resolve this in a way that justice prevails, what do we get? We get so many things. We get the pretentious Abraham Accords and this normalization, this love fest that suddenly became public between some Arab countries and Israel. We get the Palestinian Authority and Hamas at each other's necks, trading insults as who is the supreme non-power over the Palestinians. Both of them have no power and both of them want power and they want it for themselves, not for the Palestinians. We get the cancellation of uh, Palestinian elections with a tiny, small fig leaf, Jerusalem. We also get the EU, the European Union, throwing money, shovelfuls of money, until COVID-19 kicked in where it became a bit less able to do so, throwing money at the Palestinian cause, but not twitching one political muscle in the process. And we get, of course, Uncle Sam, the USA, tiptoeing on the head of a political uh, pin and requesting both parties, both the occupied and the occupier, the enforcer of violence and the sustainer of violence in equal measure calling upon them to exercise restraint, or even worse, making this one-sidedness patently obvious with President Trump and his cabal of so-called politicians grinning and with their whitened teeth and talking about deals of the century. But all this being equal, the spate of violence that happened and is happening in Jerusalem during the month of Ramadan, which is in its last week, by the way. So some people might think, let's, let's, be, let's stand for another week and then things will quieten down again. This violence that started with uh, the confrontations in front of Damascus Gate, one of the gates leading into the old city of Jerusalem, 
and I know Damascus Gate very well, leading up all the way to everything else that I just mentioned, brought world attention suddenly, media attention suddenly, political attention suddenly to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, which was supposed to be outside the so-called peace process. We had excluded Jerusalem, but we were still talking about the West Bank and talking about uh, Gaza. Or so we pretended because it kept the lid firmly on. But why did Jerusalem become again a story for the international media? It is because fists replaced words. The guns are still the same guns on the other side, but the fists on the Palestinian side out of frustration replaced words. You know, in Greek, there is a wonderful, beautiful word that is in itself expressive, thrasos. Now, what does thrasos mean? It's got a positive connotation and it's got a negative connotation. Positively, it means boldness, gumption. Negatively, it could mean insolence and impudence. But I take it as a nice word that pretty much expresses a way of feeling, a way of being. And thrasos is what I see these days on the Jerusalem streets in Arab East Jerusalem. For the likes of me, who have always advocated peaceful resistance, who have constantly sought to find resolutions, solutions, conflict resolution, win-win uh, uh, outcomes, you know what? I'm wondering now. I'm really wondering whether I also got it wrong, whether 25 years, 30 years have been lost because we were hopeful that peace with justice or as a high cleric, a Palestinian cleric in Jerusalem used to say, a solution that suits the two peoples and three faiths of the Holy Land. We've always been thinking that this is the way, that the world would wake up and say, listen, Palestinians are right to ask for their self-determination until the noose becomes too tight and thrasos becomes the way to deal with it. I dread to think of what might lie ahead. But I look at today and I fear that there have been too many lost opportunities. Take care and let's hope. What for? Don't ask me. But hope springs eternal. The medicine may be of the naive, but let me still struggle to stay in that compartment. Have a nice weekend.